Greetings, Branson Christian Church. Good morning to you. It's good to see everyone here, and a special welcome to any visitors that are here today. If you're a visitor, would you raise your hand, please? All right. Thank you. Thanks for coming. If you're from out of town, I don't know if you're from out of town or live here, but if you're from out of town, you have picked a wonderful, wonderful place to spend your vacation. And we're really blessed to have you here. And if you live here, you're doubly blessed because you get to live in these beautiful Ozark Hills. Did anyone notice the dogwoods and the uh, red buds? My, my, what a beautiful spring. Many years ago, I heard an old man say some words that I didn't forget for a long time, but he was from here. And he said that God must have been tired when he made the hills because he left it so rough and unfinished. And I sort of believed him. I was young then. I believed it for a while, but over the years, I developed a different perspective on that. I have decided that God, when he came to this part of the country, he paused and he lingered and he made sure that he got it all just right. All you have to do is get out and walk through the hills and you'll know what I mean. So thank God for this beautiful country. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today and uh, I wanted to tell you that Pastor Al has taken, yeah, Pastor Al has taken uh, a week off to get some rest. I don't think he rests much, so I think he's going to be working. He's one of those working type things where he's got things he has to do. But you pray for him and Janet this week that God will give them a good week. But he plans to be back next Sunday. I have one announcement real quickly. There will be a board meeting this Thursday evening. 6 o'clock in the fellowship hall. So please, you board members, and there's a bunch of you out there, write that down because God needs you, church needs you, and I need you really bad. So please mark that down and show up for that. Okay, uh, I think Judy has something, she, announcement. Yes, and I know that all of you have been waiting for this good news. By the way, Thrift Shop is scheduled to reopen June 3rd. And I want to thank all of the volunteers that have already. We had a meeting, and it uh, we have 24 people in this church that are willing to be involved with us in one way or the other. And we could not do this without them. Um, the only thing that else that I need to tell you is we do need some strong bodies because we have the, a room up in the education building that is completely full that goes in the thrift shop. So we've got some carrying to do before this time. And if anybody's interested in helping with that, please just give me a call. And uh, I'm looking forward to not only seeing you in church, we hope all of you will want to shop with us over there. Thank you. The preacher at the end of Ecclesiastes wrote this. He said, what's left to be said but this? Only fear God and keep all of his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. But how do you do that? Jesus said, Without me, you can do nothing. St. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul must have expected that because Jesus had also said to his followers, the things that you see me do, 
you're going to do greater things than those. Wow. But C.S. Lewis may have given us a hint as to how that would happen. Lewis wrote, if you want to get wetter, get closer to the waterfall. And that's why we're here today. We want to be more like Jesus. We have to get closer to Jesus. I think John will probably help us with that today in a sermon. Okay, for opening him, the words are on the screen. Sing verses 1, 3, and 5. Number 118 out of the chalice. remain standing for our praise music. your voices.
Please bow with me. Our Father in heaven, as we come into your presence on this beautiful day in April, we do so with thanksgiving in our hearts. It's good to have this time to put aside the cares of life and the busyness of living. It seems that we're always hurrying about and preparing and planning and fixing and organizing and worrying about how everything is going to turn out. And even sometimes while we're in church, these thoughts tend to drown out your voice and what you want to say to us. And we do want to hear from you because we need to know again and anew today that you're there and that you know us and where we are in our walk with you. For some here today, this present moment is filled with loss, with disappointment, and impairment or heartache. And the circumstances may be dreadful and filled with reasons to be sad or sorrowful. But those folks need you and they need us and the comfort of being in fellowship with you and with each other. And now, with one mind and one accord, we will pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples so many years ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Amen. Uh, sound room, this is number 48. Number 48, I told you the page number I was going to do. Jesus is the rock.
The scripture reading today is from Proverbs, third chapter, verses 5, 6, and 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He shall direct your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. This is the word of God. Thank you, Jerry. Well done. The words believe and trust are double first cousins. But there is a difference. To believe is to show acceptance of another person's words. To trust is used to demonstrate the reliance on the other's overall character. So as we go through this today, I hope to convey to you the meaning behind this special word. One of the greatest blessings that you'll ever receive in your life is to have complete trust in someone or something. And by the same token, one of the greatest disappointments that will ever incur in your life if that trust is somewhat, somehow broken. And this can happen. But my intent today is to not spend a lot of time or energy on the negative side of this. So let's try to address this subject from a couple of different angles. One from the human aspect, which would be temporal or worldly, and more importantly, from a spiritual view, which would, of course, be eternal and everlasting. To better deliver what I have in my heart, I've chosen a couple of uh, human interest stories or personal stories. And uh, I heard someone say one time, man, if you speak, don't ever talk about yourself. And, uh, generally speaking, that is true. But I'm referring back to the Apostle Paul here this morning. And remember how many times he used his personal testimonies to be able to convey to people the message of Christ? Well, obviously, I am not Brother Paul, so don't be mistaken there. However, I am going to use one of his methods. When Julie and I started dating, I, it's getting ready to get good now, folks. It's going to warm up in here, especially Julie's cheeks. <laughs> no, honey, I, I'm, I'm not going to embarrass you. But anyway, on our first date... We went out to eat at the Lone Star Steakhouse, and that was located at the corner of Green Mountain Drive and Wildwood. I expect some of you have been there before. Well, you're not going to go back because it's closed now. But anyway, as we became better and better acquainted, I made up that night, made up my mind that night that I was going to like her. But we started to get better acquainted, and I learned that Julie did not appreciate flying very much. Now, she would fly commercial, but it was only when she had to. She didn't like airplanes. So, up pop problem number one. I, at that time, owned a little Cessna 172. And folks, I will tell you that that airplane was part of my life. And I wanted, naturally, to share that, that with, with her. So what to do, what to do, what to do. I was in a dilemma for sure. I did not crowd her, if you're wondering that. Oh, no, I didn't push her at all. Now, I did tell her of a lot of the experiences I'd had, but just the good ones. I didn't tell her about the frozen carburetors or the stalls or any of that stuff. 
I told her later, but I didn't then. I made it sound as good as I could. Soaring through the puffy clouds, floating along the breeze, not a care in the world. Well, I'd even sang a few lines of that old Slim Whitman song, Jamie. I've heard Jamie sing it. I'm just a bird in the sky. Over the mountains I fly. No one can take my freedom away. I tell you, I gave it my best shot. I did everything I could do. <laughs> well, a few months went by, and I'll never forget the day when she told me that she had thought it through and she wanted to go fly with me. Well, that made my day. And to make a long story short, we had many beautiful hours soaring over these beautiful Ozark hills. She would get nervous on, in turbulence, and uh, sometimes the crosswind landings would, would upset her a little bit. She'd grab my knee, and my leg would go numb from the knee down. But she would crawl into that little airplane, and away we would go. So what was it? that enabled her to overcome the fear of flying and to entrust her life to someone else. Now, I want you to consider that as we go through this this morning and maybe decide for yourself. And I have another story. When my son, Michael, he was just a little guy, maybe two years old, I'd stand him up on a porch railing, I'd get down below, and I would hold out my hands and say, jump, son. The very first time I did this, without any hesitation, he sailed right off of that, right into my hands. Now you might think that maybe this is a little bit of blind trust, but really it wasn't. Mike was a bright-eyed little guy. He's pretty sharp. And you see that trust that he showed in that instant that enabled him and gave him the confidence to make that leap, that, that had been instilled in him since he's born, just through little things, little experiences here and there. At that young age, Mike had made up his mind that he was going to trust me. He knew by then that he wouldn't always get his way. He knew there were boundaries. There were perimeters that he's going to have to live in. But he learned to depend upon my word. That is just a little story about a father and a son, but it gives us a lot of insight about this precious thing we call trust. Men and women everywhere have a a, a deep-seated need to be able to have something that they can truly depend on. In our day-to-day -day human relationships, it becomes so necessary for our well-being that we build up and maintain trust. To our inner spirit, it's like it's like oxygen to your blood. It's so needed. The happiest people on earth are those who have developed those kind of relationships. And, of course, we've learned through this pandemic just how critical our connection to one another is. It's really become obvious. So here's the question, and... I think all of you probably knew this one was going to come around quickly. Do you trust God? Do you really trust him? What Jerry read to you this morning out of the book of Proverbs and what I am fixing to read in just a second, they can very, very well be the things that could help you cement that connection with God. Remember what Jerry read, and I'm going to read you a scripture out of the book of Jeremiah. 
chapter 17, verse 7 and 8. Now, Jeremiah was, uh, he was known as the weeping prophet. He wrote the book of Lamentations also, and uh, he lamented over the condition and the fall of Israel. But he wrote these words. He said, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river. God will honor those who trust him. You can hang your hat on that. A good example of that is found in the life of Abraham. You remember Abraham was, uh, he was actually the first Hebrew. He was the father of all the Jews, the very first one. God called him out from among his people, and he put trust in God. And the Bible says that that trust that he had in God and that belief was accounted to him for righteousness. There was only one thing righteous about this great man, one thing only. That was his trust in God. If you want to get God's attention, if you really want to get his attention, trust him, and he will pay attention. And it goes beyond believing. Remember what I told you at the very beginning, trusting is relying on the other's overall character. So just contemplate the character of God. I know that all of us in this room have prayed for someone or something earnestly. And it didn't always happen like we wanted. My friends, I'm afraid that trust goes beyond what getting what you want and maybe when you want it. Trusting our Father in heaven actually comes to us when we rely on two eternal concepts. And this is so important. Number one is our willingness, our willingness to accept God's will for our lives. And number two, even more importantly, we have to accept his timing. And that's probably the toughest. We want it done now. It'll probably never work out the way that we have it all laid out in our minds. When we're praying about something, we'll say, God, you know, we want it done like this or like this. But you can rest assured that all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. Everything that happens to you is not going to be good. That would be foolish to say that. But there is a pattern and a mixture. All things work together, the good and the bad, and that's how God brings about his purpose in our lives. We've talked a good bit about trusting God, so, you know, trusting God and other people is a two-way street, right? Are we trustworthy? Can others trust us? Can God trust us? Can he trust us to do the job? that he's chosen for us, whatever that might be. Maybe a lot of jobs. I worry many times that we neglect the thing that counts the most. Now, in this life, when your boss gives you an assignment, uh, and he can walk away and feel good about it, and not worry in his mind whether or not you're going to get it done, you're going to get it done. And the boss knows that. That's a good thing, and that's a, wonderful, that's a wonderful reputation to build up. 
because being trustworthy is one of the more virtuous character traits. But what about when the Holy Spirit entreats you sometimes maybe in the middle of the night or the wee hours, that's happened, I know, and he gives you an assignment that only you can carry out. I am convinced in my heart that every one of us here today wants God to be able to rely on us. And I know we all try hard to trust and obey. But the, the big question that I have for us here today, and folks, this is the very heart of, of this message today. What if we fail? And I can tell you, my dear friends, we will fail sometimes more than once. But remember this, you really can't fail in anything in life unless at first you've tried. I know that we often refer to the book of Job. Uh, Job's a well-known character in the Bible. And we, we, we wonder at how God could put his trust in this mortal man. But he did. He did. He said to Satan himself, he said, have you considered my servant Job? He trusted Job. I sometimes wonder how or why would God trust me? Surely, Surely I've failed too many times for God to even bother anymore. So what am I to do? What am I to do? The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, he must have been facing and going through something similar to this when he said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? He was going through some stress. Well, this is what I say to you this morning. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift, Jesus Christ, our Lord. When God looks at you, he does not see all of your failures. He doesn't. When he looks, he looks beyond our faults, and he sees our need. When he looks at us, he sees the righteousness and the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what he sees. There's an old hymn that says, This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And this is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. As I close this message, I would love to encourage you with just a few more words. When you feel like that you have failed God, don't despair. I promise you it is not the end of the world. He knows that the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. God knows that. Peter, one of his darkest hours, failed God. Not just once, three times in a row. At the same time that Jesus was going through the mock trial in that judgment hall that night before the, the day of the crucifixion, they were abusing him, spitting on him, slapping him, going through all kinds of abuse. At that same time, Peter was out on the porch, warming himself at the fire, very confused young man, and he denied, denied the Lord three times. The Bible tells us that when the rooster crowed, that Jesus turned and looked directly at Peter. And could you imagine the weight of that gaze? Peter looked away with a broken heart, 
And the Bible says that he went out and he wept bitterly. But that's not the end of Peter. It was just the beginning. He failed, sure, but just read on. The Lord was not finished with Peter. Jesus still trusted Peter. And at the tomb on the resurrection, you remember reading this? We just went through the, uh, the Lenten season and Easter. But an angel appeared to three women at the tomb that, that morning. And he told them to go tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus has arisen and he will go before them and meet them in Galilee. Well, you will fail and you will fall. But here's the key, folks. The key is to rise each time you fall. So what does a pastor say when he comes to the end of his message? Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Just before Jesus and the disciples sat down for the Last Supper, they had a conversation. Jesus said to them, let not your hearts be troubled. You trust God? Trust me. I'm going to be leaving you soon. I'm going to my Father's kingdom. I'm going to make a place for you. One of the disciples says, we don't know where you're going. And you keep talking about this father. We've never met your father. I've never seen him. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. We are one and the same. Well, they still had questions. You say that you're going somewhere and we know the way. I don't know where you're going. How can I know the way? Jesus respo uh, responded, he said, I know the way. I am the way. I will show you. Just follow me. And so as, as we prepare to follow Jesus to the communion table, let's turn to our communion hymn. Fill my cup, Lord.
on the evening that Jesus Christ was betrayed, he was gathered with his disciples in the upstairs room of a building in Jerusalem. And he was there to, to uh, celebrate the Passover with them. And they did not realize as they spent that time with the Lord it would be the last Passover they would spend with him. But also, they did not realize that they were in the presence of the Passover lamb. And he looked at his disciples and he took the bread. And he broke it. And he gave to them and he said, take, eat all of you, for this is my broken body. And then he took the cup he raised it, he blessed it, and he told his disciples, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant that is going to be given for the remission of sins. Drink this and do it always in remembrance of me. And I make this promise to you that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it anew with you in heaven. I'd like to say a few words about the tithes and offerings. We are not passing the plate yet. I feel like we're getting closer. We're not there yet, but if you'd like to give this morning, there is a little wooden box with a slot in the top out at the table on the North X entrance there where you came in, and uh, you can give your offering there. And God bless you as you do that. And uh, online, you can look on our Facebook page, Branson Christian Church Facebook, and also the uh, Branson Christian Church website. And there will be instructions there also on how to give online. At this time in our service, we're going to sing the hymn of invitation. Whether you're at home watching this later today online or you're right here, right now, I hope you will make up your mind to always place your trust in God. We will make a lot of bad decisions throughout our lives, but there's one decision that will always be the right decision, and that's to put your faith and your trust in God. So please stand as we sing our song of invitation.
Once again, I would like to thank everyone for being here today and for choosing this church, especially you visitors. Thank you, and please come back. Next Sunday, Lord willing, the real preacher's going to be here. You don't want to miss him. So please come back, you visitors. And now, may God bless you today and throughout this coming week. And I pray that he'll smile upon every one of you and give you a wonderful week. And come again. God bless you.